So today, we have a big topic of stress, and before we get started, I have a disclaimer to make, and that is, the material that I'm going to be talking about is actually a little bit stressful, um, but that's not my goal to stress you out. My goal is to impart information so that you have more awareness of the role of stress in your life and the connection with autoimmune conditions which, as you'll learn, is a really huge connection. So maybe before we get started, we might take a couple of breaths together. Recently, I learned that taking deep breaths is certainly one way of relaxing, but some breathing experts that I'm learning from are suggesting that slowing our breathing down may be even more impactful for us, down to maybe only six breaths per minute. And so the way you do that is to consider breathing in for five counts and breathing out for five counts. Breathing in for five counts and breathing out. So why don't we try it together. And you want it to flow like this. So count on your finger or however you like. Let's do six rounds, which is a full minute of five in and five out. You want to make sure that your belly is actually expanding when you're breathing in. And going towards your spine when you breathe out. Belly expands when you breathe in. goes out when you breathe out. That continuous breathing, that slow, continuous breathing is a path to relaxation, the relaxation response, which we'll learn is really the only place and time that we truly heal is when we're activating that relaxation response. Normally we're in fight flight which is go, 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 always on, get stuck in that always on stress response. But this breathing, I find for me that I use, I set up, I call them triggers, that's a bad word, but um, when I get to a stop sign, for example, or a stoplight, rather, I remember to breathe. Or if I'm getting ready for a call, I'll take one minute and do five breaths in, five breaths out, and I watch my shoulders come down. If I'm stressed out, I'm carrying my shoulders like earrings, but I find that the deep breathing, everything starts to relax. Stress and autoimmune conditions, a volatile combination. Um, a quick disclaimer that this is a stressful topic, and I'm not trying to stress you guys out today, but I want to create an awareness within you that stress has a profound implication on both triggering autoimmune conditions and perpetuating them. So to be able to learn the science, but then have hope that there's something that you can do about it. So I'm not gonna leave you hanging. Bear with me, <laughs> not trying to stress you out, <laughs> but I do wanna make you aware that this is gonna be a little bit stressful because you know, modern life is stressful enough and now we're gonna learn about the direct connection. So when we've been prevented from learning how to say no, our bodies may end up saying it for us. What do I mean by that? If you were a child and were either told or made to believe that it wasn't safe to say no, you didn't want something, you don't, didn't want to do something, you were prevented from saying no, from being yourself, from doing something that you wanted to do, your authentic self was shut down, you developed a strategy for pleasing people. You became a pleaser. You didn't listen to your true instincts. You followed other people's wishes. And Gabor Mate, who wrote the wonderful book, When the Body Says No, Exploring the Stress Disease Connection, posits that when we don't say no, our bodies may end up doing it for us. So let me give you an example of this. 
In the autoimmune mechanism, we talked about leaky gut before, right? And the intestinal barrier is selectively permeable. It lets some things in and it keeps a lot of things out. It is a smart barrier. Our immune system, it is figuring out all the time what, what's a friend, what's an enemy, right? When you can imagine that this, we're becoming too permeable. When we don't say no, we let everything in. And imagine the equivalency with autoimmune conditions is that we're letting everything in. The permeable gut allows things that shouldn't be in. So we need to become more selective, more discerning in what we let in. And that requires learning how to say no and figuring out what's most important to you and living your life and your truth authentically and being okay with saying no. And it doesn't mean that you're not valued. It doesn't mean that you're not loved. That way your body doesn't end up saying it for you. So over the course of time, we've talked about food, we've talked about gut, we've talked about toxins. Today, we are going to talk about stress. This is the total body burden, the bucket that gets filled with all of these factors. And once it gets overfilled, you've got the permeable gut and the spilling out, which is the autoimmune cascade. So let's first define stress, because if you ask 10 stress experts to define stress, you'll get 10 different answers. If you ask 10 people to define stress, you'll get 10 different answers. But I look to the American Institute of Stress to help me with the definition, because I figured they'd have a pretty good idea, considering that Hans Selye, the, the man who coined the term stress, was the founder of that institute in the 30s. This is my favorite definition that I've found. Um, from Dr. Heidi Hanna of the Institute of Stress, and it is, stress is what you feel when demands on you exceed your resources. It's a feeling that you have when there are too many demands, you feel overwhelmed and or you don't have the resources to deal with the situation. But there are different types of stress. You've heard of good stress, too. There's something called eustress or tame stress, which is positive. And that's actually a good response that you grow from. And earlier, Mary was sharing about traveling in Europe with MS, not sure if she could do it, right? And it was challenging and stressful to be in situations with cobblestone streets and going through airports and this uncertainty of how it's going to go, but she did it. She made it through the experience. So I would put that in the tame stress response category where what happened at the end, it was a growth experience. She made it through, I can do it. I can do it again. Second type of stress would be considered tolerable stress response. And this is something that unfortunately we all face very human elements of loss and pain and suffering, um, maybe a diagnosis of a disease, somebody dies that you love. Um, these are inevitable situations um, in some cases. And if we have a proper supportive environment, maybe a supportive spouse or a, a dear friend who provides comfort in the situation, and with enough time we get through it, we recover, we may also grow from that experience, but it's temporary. So the fight flight immune system gets triggered a bit, but it calms down when the stress passes. The third type of stress is not so benign, and that's the toxic form of stress, which is the ongoing stress where we get stuck in that fight flight mode have you heard of the fight-flight response? It's the being chased by the proverbial saber-toothed tiger, and we are gonna do whatever we can to run and get out of that situation to get ourselves safe. That is our main goal, is to get out of a bad situation. Our body stops digesting food, it stops healing, and it brings all of the blood and resources that we need to get out of that situation fast. But what happens? 
our modern lives are busy, crazy, stressful. We all experience this. It's everything from getting stuck in traffic to having a bad boss to just an ongoing disease process, perhaps, where we don't ever get a break. The stress becomes chronic and it starts affecting us so that our mechanisms inside us, that's that fight flight response, gets stuck in the on position. And that's where we get breakdown and ultimately leading to a disease process. Let's look at the science of stress and autoimmune conditions. We have a few nuggets here. There's evidence that both acute, that is like a car crash, for example, um, or a death of a loved one, or chronic, something that goes on for years, maybe low level stress, uh, maybe arguments with a spouse over time, causes a leaky gut, so your intestines become permeable, and that's the pathway to autoimmune conditions, what we call autoimmune expression. Now, 80% of all people with autoimmune, whether it's MS or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, report some sort of uncommon emotional stress before the advent of their disease. Does that ring a bell with you if there was something stressful going on maybe in the year leading up to your MS or autoimmune condition? Very common. The problem is when we get diagnosed with something and we feel that ongoing pain, it sets up this vicious cycle because that just creates more stress. So stick with me. So, this is perhaps the most underreported area that is staggering with the results, the findings. In the mid 1990s, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente did a study of 15,000 adults looking at how their experiences in childhood which they call adverse childhood expenses, <coughs> may have impacted disease processes, chronic disease, later in life. And this is what, um, let me tell you what the definition of adverse childhood experiences are. They looked at about 10, and they found out of 15,000 people or more that 64% of them had at least one of these. Childhood physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. <coughs> Witnessing domestic violence. This could be physical or emotional abuse. Growing up in a household where there was substance abuse, maybe alcoholism. Mental illness in the family. A family member was in jail. Or physical and or emotional neglect. <coughs> Finally, parental separation or divorce. So surprisingly, more than 60% of all adults have at least one of these. So if you resonate with this, you're definitely not alone. In fact, many people, the people that have one, 80% of them have two or more. Consider this, the source of stress when you're a child and you are in a situation where you're witnessing violence or you're abandoned or neglected, that is so powerful, your brain is just developing. You are this little unformed being that is soaking in that traumatic experience and you don't know what to do with it. You're not in control of the situation and that gets stuck in your body. It happens to affect girls way more than it affects boys. I don't know the reasons why. Let's see what happens later in life because as we ex have those experiences, we develop what's called an autoimmune personality. We may develop one. Perfectionism, workaholism, overachiever, substance abuser, chronic overgiving. Any of those ring a bell? those giving more to someone else and not giving enough to yourself is the profile of someone with this autoimmune personality. It's not our fault. We were in a situation where we were really young and we witnessed things 
that were traumatic. So these were coping mechanisms, personalities that we took on. I have to be perfect to get love. I have to do great in school and bring home A's to be loved, to prove my self-worth. Sometimes our behaviors as a result of some trauma lead to substance abuse. So there's a high percentage of people who became substance abusers who experienced these ACEs, these adverse childhood experiences. And many people who experienced these ACEs in childhood go on to become a helper later in life. So they're going to become some sort of caregiver in some way. Um, look at the mechanisms. Early traumas help to form these unconscious beliefs that we are in some way unworthy of love and possibly unworthy of good health. Those negative emotions that we stew in create this stuck on chronic stress response. We don't take great care of ourselves. Remember, we're, we care more for other people so that we'll get that love. We develop some unhealthy coping behaviors perhaps and this is a pathway to inflammation, breakdown, chronic disease, which we've already talked about. We have this ongoing stress of having a chronic illness and the disease perpetuates. So this is um, the last of the shocking science nuggets here. This is what the people who ran the study, when they got the results, they actually cried. People were blown away by the findings. Let's take a look. If a person had two or more ACEs, they were 70% more likely to get MS, type 1 diabetes, or Hashimoto's later in life. If they had two or more, they had an 80% greater risk of lupus, eczema, IBS, and asthma. These are considered, that's a Th1. Um, it's a particular type of our immune system versus a Th2 response, but both way more likelihood of getting an autoimmune condition. Rheumatic diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, look at that, 100% greater chance. Four ACEs, two and a half times more likely to develop cancer. Four, four times more likely to develop Alzheimer's. Six reduces your lifespan by 20 years. Seven, now what's fascinating about these last two, these seven aces, if this is a really healthy person who doesn't smoke, drink, eats a perfect diet, exercises every day, meditates, doing good things, if they had seven or eight aces, they still had that increased risk in some cases, triple the risk for lung cancer or a 360 times increased risk of heart disease. Staggering. Yeah. Staggering stuff. Let's get the good news. It's time for some good news. We can reverse this. This is really hopeful. There's lots we can do to become more resilient and there's lots we can do to address even early childhood trauma so whether you're in your 20s, 40s, 60s, 70s, and you're still experiencing ongoing emotional pain, or you've stuffed it down because you don't want to address it, um, there's much that we can do to heal from this. So one of the first recommendations is just to become aware that this is even a connection, and that's why I'm talking about this today. I mentioned my goal is to create an awareness because maybe you've never made the connection between things that you experienced in childhood and the fact that you may have MS or some other autoimmune condition today. So you can get your ACE score at um, many places, but one of them is aces2high.com. So become aware, step one. Step two, you have to believe that you can heal. You really have to believe that you can do this. You need to be committed to changing your health outcomes, to know that you can and then be committed to, to doing it. Now, never said this was easy. This is gonna require some courage to dig deep, 
to resolve early emotional or even re more recent emotional traumas. It's never fun, it's not easy, but to have the courage to do it because good things ha are available on the other side of this. And that means prioritizing and investing in your own emotional well-being. It means exploring and adopting some new skills perhaps and tools to address stress. Now one thing that I haven't talked a lot about is the mundane everyday stress. You know, the stress you feel of, you know, like your job and maybe there are financial pressures and so forth. All of the tools that we're going to be discussing are um, good for either the ongoing stress that you face in your daily life or dealing with more advanced or traumatic stress. And I'll share the difference between those. And really, it's, it's about becoming devoted to your self-care. So changing your habits from being someone who puts everybody else first, prioritizes your kids, your family, your job, doing other things for people, and really becoming a devotee of your own, let's call it radical, self-care, because maybe this is something that you haven't considered before. But have you heard the concept of, uh, maybe you've been on an airplane, the concept of putting your own oxygen mask on first? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about when the um, airline stewardess comes around and says, you know, before you help somebody else, put your own mask on? That's what this is about. It's really about prioritizing yourself because before you can be good for anybody, you need to take the time for yourself and really nourish yourself with some habits. So th those are some overviews for becoming more resilient. Now what are some tools that you can adopt? And I would argue the ones that work are the ones you actually do. This is not a, I'm going to do it one time and be done with it. This is a commitment to an ongoing lifestyle and practice. It's a journey. So I'm I, I like that tree. You like that tree? Uh, yeah, the, the root structure there is mm -hmm. fascinating. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. you can sit on it. <laughs> that is a wonderful tree. You could sit on it, and she is. Um, and we talked earlier about doing some slow conscious breathing. So that's free, it's easy, and it's a way to bring yourself down and stop wearing your ears like earrings and allow everything to calm down and relax and activate what's called the parasympathetic nervous system just by taking slower, longer, rhythmic breaths. Try for six a minute. Journaling. So that's what she's doing, um, is journaling. And there's science that shows that when we write things down, let's say about these um, adverse childhood experiences, when we just get them on paper, it helps to resolve the trauma just by writing it down. I don't know if you've tried that before, but it's something to consider, especially if you enjoy writing. Um, it doesn't matter if you're using longhand, script, or using a computer. Whatever works for you, one thing to consider is just getting it down on paper. Another thing to do is to, to share it. You know, this is, when we keep things bottled up, as Gabor Mate says, the body keeps the score. Until we start to bring this stuff out into the open, it's going to stay inside, stuck and hidden. So by getting it out of us, sharing with a trusted friend, a pastor, therapist, is a wonderful way to start that process. Some things that have more science behind them include hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming, heart rate variability training. These are all practices that you can do in conjunction with a practitioner. Um, on your own, in the case of the heart rate variability training, there's a wonderful organization called HeartMath. I put in the resources, so you'll see that in a minute. But there's a device you can use that measures your heart rate variability, and you want to um, try getting yourself in the green, and that's a good thing when you've got high heart rate variability. A lot of science behind these four practices yoga, tai chi, qigong, meditation. The point of sharing these tools is that not everything is going to work for everybody, but you may find something here that sounds interesting to you. Much research has been done about all four of those as not just relaxing techniques, but techniques that actually profoundly change your brain, even. 
by thickening your cortex, meditation has been found to actually change the structure of your brain. You've heard of neuroplasticity, it's the concept that we can, in fact, build new synaptic connections. Our brains can grow. We thought that wasn't possible, now we know. Those are four things for you, you to consider. Now, have you heard of tapping or emotional freedom technique called EFT? It's a practice that you can also do on your own, and I would recommend that you Google these things if they seem interesting to you to look them up. And so in a Google search, you could do EFT for anxiety, EFT for relaxation, and you'll learn um, by following along with someone who shows you where to tap on your body. These are considered meridian point points, and you're going to activate your parasympathetic nervous system which is your healing response. And while you're thinking about something that may be very stressful to, to you, and the idea is as you go through the, the tapping, your body actually relaxes and you'll notice that when you started the process, you were super stressed and maybe by the end of it, you're less stressed. It's been very helpful for me personally. I learned how to do it and um, I've had a couple instances like having to deliver the eulogy for my mother, for example, which was one of the most stressful times I can remember in my life. And before I got up to deliver the eulogy, and I was frightened and um, really afraid I was gonna burst out in tears, I used the EFT tapping and was actually not only able to make it through, but I think I was able to do it with much more grace than had I not done it before. So something to consider. Shaking, I don't know if you're familiar with animals, if they were just chased, something was chased by a lion, when they are in the clear, they shake to release the trauma, right? Shaking, dancing, powerful therapeutic techniques to help rid your body of trauma. Uh, I would encourage you to do a little bit more exploration online, Consider this if that sounds like something that resonates with you. I know some of you enjoy dancing, so this could be, in fact, a really interesting way to help relieve stress. Energy medicine, belief shifting, powerful tools that I'm not worthy, changing that belief to I'm wor worthy no matter what. I'm worthy just for who I am. Not because I bring home A's on a report card or not because I do things, but just for being me. Um, that belief shifting process, really powerful tools to help you transform your belief system. And when you do, you get in alignment with those new positive beliefs, your subconscious mind will start working to deliver the health outcomes that align with, I am worthy, I am healed, I am well. These are some things to consider with a practitioner who's experienced in this. EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Response, something like that. Scientifically proven to be a very therapeutic tool for people suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So a therapist will work with you and you'll follow a finger while moving your eyes back and forth, um, something to explore if that resonates with you, and some other things like traumatic release exercises, somatic therapy, uh, lots of research about these techniques that work. And finally, there is a system called dynamic neural retraining that requires about an hour a day for six months for people who have any issues that range from chronic fatigue, um, multiple chemical sensitivities, food sensitivities, anything that um, is related to the, the trauma experience and autoimmune conditions, really check that out. There's home-based videos that you can do, or there's a, an in-person course that you can consider things to explore. So. Here's the question, which actions will you take to resolve perhaps your own emotional pain? Nothing will work 
unless you give it a try. So we have some resources here for you to consider. There are books, a wonderful book called Childhood Disrupted by Donna Jackson Nakazawa, who herself, she's a science journalist, who's also an author and who recovered from an autoimmune condition or two. And she writes her experience of losing her father when she was 12 and how that had a profound impact on her life and how she put in place what she calls a joy plan, her joy plan to get joy back into her life. Highly recommend that one and some others. I won't go through all of them. Um, Biology of Belief, I'd like to comment on this. This is Bruce Lipton. It's a wonderful book in which he talks about how your biography becomes your biology. Those things that you think about, those beliefs that you have, become who you are, maybe your personality types. And maybe those adverse experiences that we have in childhood, unless we intervene and do something to stop that process, that inflammatory cascade of stress, the body will start expressing for us. So this is a great opportunity to put a stop in that process and consider some of these resources for healing trauma and stress. Any questions? Kent. Who was the author of Biology of Belief? His name is Bruce Lipton, L-I-P-T-O-N. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The gentlemen who wrote these two books are trauma experts. This is Gabor Mate. And these are just some, there, there are many, many websites to explore. But I want to put the tools back on because this is really. Well, I should go from, I'll let you start with your tools. My okay. heart. Great. This is really um, it's the expression where the rubber meets the road. It's the ones that you do. They're called practices because you have to keep practicing, right? I mean, meditation, everybody knows they should meditate, but I'm not sure everybody has a practice. And as I worked with uh, one client who said she really wanted to meditate, she knew it was good for her, she had read the science about it, but for some reason she just couldn't get herself to sit for 20 or 40 minutes. And I asked her, have you considered sitting for one minute? Just one minute. Maybe just those six breaths times 10 seconds each, it's a form of meditation. So don't let it overwhelm you that it has to be complicated. You can just start wherever you are. Does anybody have any thoughts about these or have you tried them? Um, does something resonate with you? I don't know what um, Guy Gong is. Chi Gong. 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 I don't know about it. It's a, um, an ancient Chinese practice that's like Tai Chi, mm -hmm. and I can't, I don't know enough about them. It's very slow movements. Yeah. Oh. Feeling the energy as you move yes. and all these balanced things. Okay. You'll see some people in the park, like a lot of people all together, and they're doing these really slow movements. It's like, a, I guess it's almost like a moving meditation. That's right. Perfectly Thank said. Thank you. Perfect. For a meditation, I there's this quote, I forgot who said it, but it's like, everybody should meditate for at least 10 minutes a day, and if you don't have enough time, you should meditate for an hour. Exactly. <laughs> that's very fabulous. Good. I love that. I wish I remember who said it, but that's the gist of it. That's mm -hmm. a great comment. Mm -hmm. I think it was the Dalai Lama who said that if, if children were taught meditation and meditated for 10 minutes a day, within 10 years there would be no more violence in this world. It helps to build these muscles of compassion and empathy, not just for other people, but for ourselves. Quiets the nervous system down. And when you get aligned with these things, you're no longer aligned with those other energies that are a little more violent. Also, that we did it in one of the, the previous um, sessions we were doing. If 
you're panicking and you're saying, oh my gosh, this is not going to work, or I can't do this, within that sentence, if you just say, I can not do this, you're actually meditating within the sentence mm -hmm. and you will get insights because it gives space for your subconscious mind which is more gentle and slower to actually chip in and say, well, what about that? But if we talk really fast, we don't get to have that space, which is the blessing of the meditation is you get access to all of your resources. So yeah, it could be six belly breaths, it could be within a sentence. Just slow it down and you're in, in, in that space of meditation and resourcefulness. I'd like to add one thing on top of that, and that's just sitting. Just sitting with nothing to do, no book, no device, no iPad, no TV, just sitting and listening to whatever comes up. And this is actually kind of scary for many people because sometimes the only thing that comes up are tears. You know, sometimes we don't know why, but I would suggest that that's a wonderful opening. And sometimes I find that just putting one hand on my heart and one on my belly, just comforting myself and sitting there, allowing whatever comes up to come up and it's okay, is profound self-care, right? I mean, you're nurturing yourself. We all become our own parent, right? Internalize that. But just know that there's nobody else in this world that's, that cares about you as much as you do, right? There's mm -hmm. nobody else that has the privilege and the opportunity to take care of yourself like you do. So to really honor that, and I mean, it is radical in the sense that maybe we don't, we've, met, we've never done it, but I just would invite you to explore the idea of just sitting and allowing whatever comes up because that's healing in and of itself and just stick with it and you'll start to hear some inner guidance. Should I take that job? You know, everything from what's happening in your life, what's present, what's coming up, to maybe something that happened when you were little that you didn't want to think about, but all of a sudden it's starting to come out. Just allow that to happen. I just wanted to comment on, um, you know, after 9-11 happened, I remember reading this email and it and it just said, if everyone in the world would just take a moment every day to find the inner peace, mm -hmm. just imagine what could happen. It kind of went off with something yeah. else. Mm -hmm. I mean, to your point, if we start with ourselves, think about a ripple in a pond, a still pond. All we can control is our ourself, our response to the world. We can't control anybody else or anything as much as we'd like to. We just can't. But if we start with us, I mean, imagine the possibilities for the ripple effect. If we take responsibility, we may not have asked for whatever condition we have. It doesn't really help to blame others or get angry about it. Um, of course, you get upset, you grieve, you go through those stages. But at the end of the day, just to be empowered to take responsibility for your health outcomes, I, it's just really powerful. So, thank you. Thank you. Segway from what Palmer was talking about, one of the tools. The three tools I use, four, I also, I used to do life coaching. And I really want to say that life coaching is actually really good because it will take you to, from where you are towards where you're going. It'll also help give you a lot of tools. But I first started doing coaching and then I realized there's some other stuff under here that needs to be looked at. And that's when I started training in other things. So the three tools I'm gonna be working and talking to you about and giving you guys tools is the NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, Hypnosis, and Hypnotherapy. Because with NLP, what we do, and that's what we're going to do today, is we're going to 
find out, and I'll give you one of the typical mind maps of someone with MS. Um, she actually, it's a, one of my clients coined this word, her internal voice called Maleficent. We're gonna talk about Mrs. Maleficent in your head. Um, so what NLP does is actually find how are you doing, what you're doing now, what mind maps are going on, and then giving you an alternative mind map. So without needing to work on all that created that mind map, we can actually do a tremendous shift. NLP is amazing with PTSD, uh, sudden deaths, things that you're not able to cope with, you can really move out of that mind map very quickly. Hypnosis is used a lot with, like we did in the first session, a recording in which you're every night listening to this great recording, which is starting to shift your beliefs, but it's very gentle. It doesn't necessarily deal with all the background, but it does start moving you out of your stuck patterns, right? Uh, it's got to be this way. And hypnotherapy uses a lot what's called regression therapy, and that is really good for work with ACE. Because when there's a feeling or an anxiety or I can't say no, in hypnotherapy you can actually go back to when did you decide it's not, you know, it's not safe to say no. And you can actually go back to the three-year-old and attend to your internal three-year-old that's still running the game and tell her, no, honey, I'm here. You can say no, you're fine, I'm here with you. And make those shifts in the subconscious. And then you realize that in your world today, you're able to say, oh, no, no, honey, you actually sound like yourself. Oh, no, honey, I, that's, that wouldn't work for me. How about we do this? And so it helps you work on those beliefs and the beliefs that are creating the stress. So the one we're going to work on today is the NLP. How can NLP help with the ongoing stresses, right, the chronic stress? Well, just like last time we talked about, NLP says one of its presuppositions is whenever you're needing to take a choice, you actually are taking the best choice you consider at that moment, right? So if you regret something, you need to remember that at that moment when you had to take the decision, it was your best choice, you know, with what you knew, with the information you were receiving, and the time you had. The next NLP presupposition that we're going to work on today is called the map is not the territory. What does that mean? A map, what is a map, right? It's kind of like a, an interpretation of what's really going on. Our minds do this. So there was actually a lecture from Bruce Lipton, the biology of belief. He said, imagine your whole mind, the subconscious mind and the conscious mind, is like it, the territory is this whole screen, right? Your subconscious mind is receiving billions of bits of information at all times. What temperature is it? How much light is in here? Is someone calling me from outside? Um, what's happening over here? Should I shift? Do I need some water? What's the best heart rate, right? So it's doing tons of stuff in the background. And your conscious mind really can only retain in every, sec every moment. I always say it's like the seven bits of inf information per moment. It can only retain so much. So what happens is your subconscious mind does almost all the work and then just gives you the information that maybe you need right now or you're expecting to see, right? Or that's aligned with your belief system. So if I've been in war and I believe I'm about to be, I can be blown up in any moment, I will be in here having this kind of reaction to things because one of my seven bits at all moments are check out for bombs, for example, right? I'll give an image, always an image is worth a thousand or 10,000 uh, words. Imagine if this is the space of the hard drive of your mind. Your subconscious mind is taking all this information. Your conscious mind is taking it that. What does that mean? That's the map you're functioning under. And the map of all the information that's in this room that's happening right now, your subconscious is going, to te is going to give you the information that is most aligned with what you're believing in. Okay, and that you'll see why that's important for us to work on 
What am I taking in? What are the seven bits I'm focused on? All right. Why does it do this? Well, I mean, think about, for example, when you learn to drive. When you first learn to drive, there's way too much information you're trying to learn, right? Oh, I've got to be, got to look at the mirrors. I got to look, and then I have to accelerate, and then I have to, I can't brake and accelerate at the same time. I've done that before. It will spin the car. Um, but all this stuff, and so at the very beginning, you're on overload, right? You don't have the radio on. You don't want your partner to talk, and you need the windows up because you're like, just, 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 <laughs> you know. But then, what happens? You got the radio on, you're having a conversation, you da da da, you get to where you need to get. Because what? It's no longer important, it's actually become subconscious. Your driving gets taken over by the subconscious. Once it's been done a few times, it just happens automatically, which is a good thing. It's a shortcut. But if we become accustomed to treating ourselves a certain way that's maybe not that positive or to never expect help and that becomes unconscious, it doesn't serve, right? So NLP helps us figure out what's our map and maybe we don't need to change everything that's happening out there because there's tons of stuff happening out there. Maybe we need to change our map to be focused over here. There's more opportunities. Things are sweeter, kinder, more collaborative. So what are you sorting for? Imagine if life is an ongoing classroom. And imagine if your seven bits, how you are sorting life is through Mrs. Maleficence. Now Mrs. Maleficence has taken the job from maybe your dad plus your third grade teacher and uh, a meanie that was in your life. And so you go around your life in this classroom, in this map of the world, in which there's only one chance. In which if he breaks up with you, I'll never get married. Or if you get fired, that's it. There's nothing else out there. There's no other choices. I should have I should have done work, worked harder, because that's the last chance. Many of my clients with MS, before their first exacerbation, something was going on in their lives. There was a divorce or 2008, the crisis. And they were thinking, I have to hold on to this job. If I lose this job, it's the end of my world. They were, they were living in the life in the classroom of Ms. Maleficent. In Ms. Maleficent's classroom, there's only one right answer. That's very black and white thinking. No, I've got to get this right. If I don't do this the right way, if I don't raise my kids the right way or eat the right way, failure. I might as well not even, you know, I might as well die. I'm not going to do this right. Right? So it's very, it's a lot of inner stress, isn't it? Something, is it about something that's happening outside? It's about how we filter, how we sort. In Miss Maleficent's class, in her life classroom, it's very competitive out there. And there's a fierce independence. Oh, I have to, oh, I can help her. No, I can't ask for help. I, I don't want to intrude. I don't want to be a bother. I, you know, you have to be fiercely independent. And you can't show weakness very competitive and what you're doing out in the world who you're dating how you're dressing what your car looks like is a reflection of who you are so if all of a sudden someone doesn't want to date you anymore that's reflected on you you don't want to date the guy who's a nice guy you want to date the guy that looks good because it's a reflection on you Mrs. Maleficent's class. And in Miss Maleficent's class, there's that internal, well, as long as you do your best, but it's not this best, is as long as you give it your all every time. Or don't even try. That's Mrs. Maleficent's classroom. Would this be a stressful way of living? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, with NLP, we say, you know what? I don't want this map. 
some of this is familiar. Let's, let's move my map over. And let's go to Mrs. Weatherspoon's class. In Mrs. Weatherspoon's, there isn't just one choice. Everything's a learning process. You try it. How many times? This is the fifth class we've had. I figured out the video. I figured out how to plug it in. It just took me five times. Yay, it's fine. I didn't have to get it right the first time. I came early again today. And it was like, oh, wow, look. I have some extra time. Everything's a learning process. You can do it as many times as you want. Actually, the more times you do it, the more things you discover. In Mrs. Weatherspoon's, there's not one right answer. You're not, um, I think what she was already saying, you know, she was talking about there's only one right answer. If not, you fail. In Mrs. We Mrs. Weatherspoon's, it's like, oh, honey, just participate. As long as you're being authentic, you're doing great. There isn't a right, wrong answer. That was only in elementary school, right? Life isn't gradable. Just be. You know, show up. It's it's more than enough. In Mrs. Weatherspoon's, you just ask what you need for. If you need more time at work for this project, go ahead and ask. It's a collaboration. Hey, Mr. Smith, you know, your boss, I know you want to get this on Friday. I'm noticing this. It would be really good if we had some more time. And maybe Mr. Smith will say, oh, I wasn't aware of that. Oh yeah, the client doesn't expect until next Thursday anyway. Go ahead, just you know, take as long as you need. <laughs> Why didn't I ever ask, right? And Mrs. Weatherspoon, that's the thing. You're like, oh, let me ask for what I need, and you know, let's see how much I can get from it, and make this pleasurable experience. And actually, by asking, you create these great relationships with people. Asking the HR, hey, can someone help me with this online thing? This is outside my territory. And they'd be like, oh, if you need it, and they go and help you. And all of a sudden, you have a new relationship with your HR, and your kids end up having the same age, and you end up doing barbecues, right? There's no competition. There's no fierce independence. It's about collaboration. In Mrs. Weatherspoon's, your answers who you hang out with, your grades, do not reflect who you are. You're you. If your car breaks down, it's your car that's breaking down. It's nothing to do with, oh God, I'm just such a poor blah, 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 blah. It's just your car broke down. It's just he has a different journey and, and could not have the journey with you in his life. You know, It's not about you. It's about your own stuff. And Mrs. Weatherspoon's best only means, oh, show up, you know, have fun with it, collaborate, and start, learn something new. Just be there is best. That's, that's best. Very different than every single time. You've got to be your best. Right? This doesn't require procrastination. When you have to give it your all every time, you're just like, oh, you don't want to start. So whose class are you in right now? Ms. Maleficence? Only one chance or else the end of the world. There's only one right answer. It's very competitive. Everything you do is a reflection on you, you know, so your your personality is like constantly you know, vigilant to is this gonna say something about me? And people are gonna say I'm a failure. And it's all about do it all, all, all. Or is your classroom just about learning and participating and collaborating and asking and, and know who you are and just answers an answer. It's nothing to do with you. If he breaks up, it's about his stuff. You know? Maybe he needs a model that looks a certain way in a car. Maybe he's got the issue. You don't. It's nothing to do with you. Just have fun, collaborate, and learn. So, I don't know why this is doing this twice. I'm, I'm repeating so that you guys really get the information. <laughs> this is very important. All right. So decide which one you want to sort for. So this is the thing. What we're not conscious of in NLP 
is, is when we enter a room, or we, we've just been told information, like, hey, the job is moving over, over the hill, or we just notice a new ache, we actually have a, what's called a virtual question, an internal question that helps us sort. It's how our conscious, those seven bits, our conscious sorts. So if Miss Maleficent is running your life, one of these questions might be what you sort for every time you're needing to make a choice. Are you sorting for, oh, what's the right way of doing this? Or are you sorting for, oh, I'm noticing something here. What must be wrong? Did I pull something? Did I? Or are you sorting for, as you get up here going, oh, you know, I had a client as a kid. She was like, she was so nervous. She always had to go right into the bathroom before she went on stage. And so we found out what she's sorting for is, what if I fail? What if I get up there and fail? That's a good internal state. Do you think having that question in your mind helps you be on stage and do your skit? No. no. This one is actually very common. How can I make this better? It doesn't sound too bad. But what happens if every time I come up here, I'm focused on making my presentation better? Am I focused on you guys? Am I putting myself a whole bunch of pressure? What is better? Is it quality, you know, is that 100%? Is that 110? What is better? Better than what? Better than that YouTube presentation that, you know, we all end up doing now? Actually, there was a, I was showing someone the other day, I was showing my sister, she was a gymnast when we were in, in high school. And I was showing her a comparison of the Olympics gymnastics in the 80s and the Olympics gymnastics now. Who are you comparing yourself to? The Olympic gymnastics now? I don't even know how they do all that. It's like we continuously compare ourselves now to the World Wide Web. We're no longer comparing ourselves, which is already difficult enough, to who's in our classroom. We're comparing ourselves to six billion people. And what happens? There's someone always better, better than us. So then what, are we a failure? If we're not better than Tiger Woods, we might as well not even try to golf. But Miss Witherspoon would say, hell, golf is fun, collaborative, you learn something, and you have a great time. Let's play golf, rather than I have to be better each time, right? This is another one that people filter when they come into, or they're making a decision. Well, what are other people going to think? Well, if I buy this car, what are other people going to think? You know, everyone's environmentalist. I can't afford the electrical, but I have to buy the electrical because what are people going to think if I buy a standard car? There's all this pressure because we think people have, you know, these very high standards when people are like, oh, cute car. <laughs> but we've been racking our whole weekends. What's our, you know, what are people going to think? The famous word, shouldn't, shoulda, constantly, oh, I should be more, I should be better. Anything that's more better, which means it's just these descriptive words that just think you know where because there's no end point, right? Oh, and the do your best is torturesome. But Mrs. Weatherspoon would be asking you in your head as you come into this room or as you're deciding something or you've just been told something, she might say, oh, how could this be fun today? Maybe we can like move the table around. Maybe we can, you know. Or she will ask, how can this be rewarding? Just get something out of it. You don't have to be perfect, just rewarding. Or how can I contribute here? It's no longer about you. You completely connect to your environment when your internal question, how can I contribute? What's to love here? Imagine your mind how, what it sorts consciously of all those billions of bit. If you come into a room and you're like, what's to love here? 
oh, I like this, or all oh, these people sound, the galley's energy, oh, I love these people here. Imagine that. What's your joy, right? What's really happening is you're sorting. You're sorting or you're sorting. And that's where your seven bits go. So, any place you guys can think of before we of a situation. Let's even take one example and see the two ways. Same situation. Your car doesn't work in the morning. You, you know, you get up to go to work and the car won't start. What happens if Miss Maleficent is, has your mind mouth? What do you sort for? What do you think? Failure. Oh, this is a failure. I can't believe I didn't, you know, maintain my car better. What are people going to think if I'm late at work? They're going to be like, ah, she can't get her act together. What's wrong? What's wrong? Oh my gosh, am I going to need a new car? I can't do a new car. I just bought. Oh, probably did it wrong. I probably turned it on wrong. I probably should have, should have. What about Mrs. Weatherspoon? Think about it. Take a moment. Imagine you're in your car and you're sorting for Mrs. Weatherspoon's map. And it's early in the morning and the car won't start. What kind of ideas come to your head? Take some of these and just think what your subconscious gives you as you ask yourself these questions. I'm trying. <laughs> well, I'm going to miss the commute traffic. <laughs> I'm going to miss the commute traffic. Oh, that'll be fun. I'll have a story to tell at work. I'll collaborate, right? Didn't really want to go in anyway. I didn't really want to go in. Maybe this is a great opportunity to ask my boss about the staying at home on Fridays and working from home. <laughs> yep. What's fun about this? Oh, maybe I can ask that, I would say guy, but you know, that girl at work, if she can take me to work. That'll be fun. Hmm. All sorts, of same situation. I will say I have had that happen, and I go back in the house and say, "Honey, I'm taking the other car today. Mine didn't start. You take your van." <laughs> so, it's like, yeah. crap. <laughs> yeah. So, think of one of these, and on the top of your page or there. Underline one, and what I would suggest is this month, take a sentence, something like this, or you can, you know, change it, up it a little bit. How can this be creative? And use it all the time. Every time you go into a place, every time someone asks you a question, every time you, this is a practice. What I usually do with NLP, what we do is we have you, so do this for a moment, go back to a situation recently that it was like, oh, internal stress, here we go. And go back this time, and as you're hearing or experiencing whatever, bring one of these questions, because you're training now your subconscious. Oh, let's try this new way. And what NLP usually does is we go to three past events, and then we go to three future events, because we're helping the subconscious learn a new habit. Instead of taking 30 days, we can actually just take 30 practices, right? So think of something that happened to you recently that was like, oh, I can't, oh, I have to deal with this. Oh, shoot, this is going to. And put one of these in and notice what happens. Anyone want to share any? Well, I feel like completing a task is always good. <laughs> is, uh, but not beating myself up because of the length of doing it, or how long it takes to do it. Um, I mean, that could be either just making a salad or completing, you know, a job that I'm doing um, for a client. <laughs> I kind of have, that's what's changed a lot with me, is being able to do things more timely. I mean, I'm already kind of 
methodical in, in how I do things already. And so it's just accentuated. Exactly. Because and critique it, takes place a big part. And there's a critique, if there's a right way, if there needs to be a need for perfection, if I've got to do it a certain way, that all gives you stress because to do it all a certain way can take more time, right? And you say, you know what, i got five minutes. What can I, how can I make a fun salad out of these five minutes? Mm -hmm. I'll just do an egg salad. Instead of everything in the kitchen and you think, yeah, now I've started cooking where if it's more than six ingredients or something, that just, it takes me an hour. Or making a sauce, I think, oh, I'll just make a thing of this sauce. And then all of a sudden I realize, oh, I need to chop garlic, I need to chop gels, I need to, you know, bring in this and that, and, you know, and I'm walking all over. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of it, I just have to lay down. <laughs> so fatigue has changed. But I think it's also just doing too much. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe it's like, how can I make this rewarding? Well, maybe can get my kids involved or maybe I can get the neighbor and we can share. I know I was I was in a center there was eight of us living there and I hate cooking and so to make it rewarding we organized it so that each of us would cook only one day a week. <laughs> you know it was fun it was you know collaboration I you know even sometimes when it was my turn I was like oh shoot I think I'm gonna murder us pizza. <laughs> It was enjoyable. So the book I want to recommend is called The Gifts of Imperfection. Because most of us have that need to get it right, to be perfect, to be a certain way, feel guilty if we don't. And this is a really good book about someone who's gone through the process of shifting from, you know, I've got to raise my kids the right way, I've got to do this, I've got to look a certain way, I've can't show my weaknesses. I have to prove myself, prove my worthiness. Um, I actually have the um, CD, and so I can listen to it in the car. It's a great one to listen mm -hmm. to and realize, oh yeah, that's my map. I'm going to shift that. Is she French? Bernay? I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, First. Brene Brown. There is an accent on the Brene. Okay. She's from Texas. Texas. And I would add to that wonderful suggestion that you should search for two TED Talks of hers that she's done. TED, which stands for Technology, Education, and Design, TED Talks, um, and her name. And she gave one on vulnerability, which is magnificent, and another, I forget the the topic, but along those lines, it's like part one and two, and they're worth, they're each about 18, 20 minutes. And you do that on? On YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ted, just search Ted Talk, Ted Talk Brene, Brene Brown. Brown. Is that, you do that on YouTube? <laughs> I don't know if it's Some of us are challenged on, online. So I would just <laughs> say that the good thing about this is you don't need to change your whole life. You don't need to make your life simple and easy and stress-free and, you know, not have any... It's moving out of certain mind maps and just catching yourself. Oh, wait a minute. There's that right word. There's that better word. Let's use the collaboration word or the rewarding word. Too many Nice. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.